Good morning, everybody. Indeed, this is a, a compression by a factor of 10, I have to say, because it's uh, actually we did, I did for the graduate uh, uh, school in, in, in Heidelberg a while ago, because it's been updated. So it would be somewhat superficial, but of course I try to give a good overview and at least mention all the aspects that I think are important for new mobile computing. So that in the next two hours of lecturing and in particular also the one hour of discussion, I hope you get a good impression of what it means. Um, I will also start by saying that the definition and the understanding of what your mobile computing is, I think has changed, in particular over the last couple of years. So this is my plan. Uh, I will introduce ideas and concepts which are kind of generic and, and I will particularly then add up with what I think is a definition of neuronal computing and also uh, some reasons on why I think we absolutely have to do it, which is not accepted by everybody by the way. Uh, then I will show you some specific implementations uh, which are state of the art, which are the systems that are currently in use, and you are already users of them, two of them are okay. Then I will show you some examples of applications, just some examples, there are many, and this is just a very small subset, and then maybe point to some future directions on uh, where I think uh, uh, some development that may be interesting uh, for those who are actually building out there. Uh, and that is a worthwhile to work on. So let's start with the concepts. And very often, neuromorphic computing is, uh, is, this is the only historical slide I show, is thought to be invented by Carl Wien, who was actually, uh, was a student of this guy here, uh, uh, Richard Feynman. And, uh, but I don't think, if you really uh, see neuromorphic as a more general principle, that Carl Wien was the first <coughs> To, to do this. Carbon Media actually wrote a famous book on VLSI and uh, analog VLSI and neuro <coughs> systems, I think that's what it was called, and it's often seen as the Bible of neuromorphic computing. But I think what this book really is and what Carbon Media's work is, is a very specific type of neuromorphic computing. In particular, it's analog neuromorphic computing and it's analog neuromorphic computing with transistors being operated in a very weird area of operation, which is uh, this very small gate block, which is so that will automatically produce an exponential function. I will talk about that later. So this is a very specific flavor, which for a long time has been the definition of neuromorphic computing. But I think uh, the way it's developing now, it's time to look back. And uh, there is actually Richard Feynman himself, this guy here, who, interestingly enough, of course, this picture has been taken long before 1982. I think it was actually in Los Alamos when he worked on the Manhattan Project. And, and this is, uh, funny enough, this is a John von Neumann, who is, uh, as we all know, one of the uh, fathers of uh, the modern computer architecture. This is Stanislav Ulam, by the way. And, and Feynman, later, in 1982, uh, uh, worked a lot on the principles of computing, and he made this statement, which I will read to you, because I find it quite interesting. Uh, he, he invented a rule. He said, the rule of simulation that I would like to have, this is his private idea, he said, is that the number of computer elements required to simulate a large physical system. And when he talked about physical systems, he really meant physics, I think. That is uh, systems made of atoms uh, and molecules. On the other hand, I would think a physical system is everything that is made of physical elements. Uh, so also neurons and synapses are made of atoms and molecules, of course. Uh, but also uh, as, as a computational unit themselves, they are physical units. So I would like to extend this also to neural systems. So recall the system in the large physical system, it is only proportional to the space-time volume of the physical system. Space and time are the two coordinates which are often, which are obviously important for computing. It's the number of, of, of elements which just extend in space, the number of processors, for example. Uh, so that's one aspect. But the other one, of course, is time. And he already pointed to time uh, uh, that, that, that a uh, system occupies a space in, uh, in both in, in, in physical space but also in time. Because if you want to look, for example, to the development of the brain, uh, it's very important whether you do this over 100 milliseconds or two years. And I made this already in my introductory lecture. I made this very clear. And this will be one of the most important messages of today's lecture is that time 
is a very, very important coordinate, and to my taste is often forgotten in when people do computational neuroscience. Uh, they look at rather, rather static pictures with a fixed snapshot in time, and I think you really have to look in space time. And this is what, what, what uh, Richard Feynman already pointed out. I don't want to have an explosion, this is what he says now. That is, if you say I want to explain this much physics, I can do it exactly and in a certain size computer. Okay? If I'm doubling the volume of space time, it means that I need an exponentially larger computer. I consider this against the rules. So you want that uh, space and time scale with the size of the system. So the doubling, the, 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 so the time you want or the space you want, you would not just need the, the computer that is twice as large. It's an argument for scaling. Uh, but of course we see that that's not always the case. And, and I've shown you one example already in uh, my introductory lecture and I will show it again later today. Now, when Feynman talked about simulation, <coughs> he really, as I said, looked at condensed metaphysics. And I will also, because I'm a physicist, I will also start by looking at condensed metaphysics. This is a piece of condensed matter here, right? Actually, it's a piece of a transistor. It's a very impressive picture. It has been prepared very nicely that people have cut through the transistor. This is a vertical cut through the transistor. And, and you see all these little blips here, all right? And these blips are actually individual atoms. You see a regular structure here in the gate. You see a, a very nice hexagonal structure here in what's called the silicon substrate and the somewhat fuzzy irregular thing, which is silicon dioxide. So this is typically a, 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 a piece of solid state. And, and we often, when we talk about solid state physics, there is this number 20, 10 to the 23, which is the upper garden constant. That's the number of atoms in a mole. Now you see you can today, you can actually go, this is a picture taken with an atomic uh, a force microscope, you can count individual atoms. So these are, I don't know how many, probably a couple of hundreds. You know? So uh, the, 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 the transition from large numbers to small numbers, which is often called the transition from macroscopic to microscopic through mesoscopic system, that's a very important thing. And physics has developed many approaches towards understanding these, what people call multi-particle systems. And my argument is that neuroscience is basically doing the same thing, and <coughs> maybe there are things we can learn from each other. So in physics, uh, understanding multi-particle systems means the following. The first thing you do traditionally, and that's also what you later do in, in neuroscience, is you have a systematic exploration of macroscopic features. Features that you only observe if you have many particles. Typically the conductance, for example of a, a piece of, of semiconductor or magnetization. And then there are also uh, even dynamic phenomena like phase transitions, for example, uh, between liquid and solid, or between superconducting and non-superconducting, superfluid, non-superfluid, whatever. And if, actually, that is a very, a very important uh, part of the work of solid state physics these days. Then what people do is, well, they say, we want to understand this microscopically. So we go down to a, a microscopic level by looking to individual atoms, and they prepare probes. Uh, and to look at microscopic field. This is an example of a probe that's being prepared by an atomic force microscope. And, and, and then you try to, to link either from top to bottom or from bottom to top the microscopic to the microscopic feature. You try to understand the conductance of this channel here, for example, uh, by, by really understanding the features of, of the, of the, uh, the silicon atoms and their arrangement. And so what you do is you can do model building theory and analytical treatments. There are very good. Uh, theories, for example, that describe the conductance of solid states. You can do model building theory and numerical treatment, in particular if, for example, crystal stru structure starts to be too complicated to do an analytical calculation, then, then computers, supercomputers, are a very useful tool, uh, for example, to understand uh, superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity, for example. So that's sort of the, the approach that most labs in, in large particle physics in the world do. But then there is another way of doing things, and that has only developed recently, and is very much following the idea of, of, uh, of Feynman. It's to build what I call control reduced size physical model systems, uh, also sometimes called synthesis. Okay? So, for example, you take real atoms, wherever you get them from, and you put them into a synthetic lattice, for example, by doing optical traps. Actually, people do that in Innsbruck. If you just go, you have a one hour drive from here, you can go to a spectacular lab. I visited that a while ago, but people do exactly that. And what they have is they call that quantum emulators. All right? And why would you do that? Well, of course, there are ways to look at, uh, at solid state physics in a very superficial, a very simplified way. 
Uh, for example, there is a so-called easy model, which is a numerical simulation of a two-state system. Uh, so uh, a two-state system is a system where an individual element and particle is just two state. For example, uh, the direction of the spin relative to a magnetic axis or something like that. And then this is uh, all these little dots here, the black ones and the white ones represent one of these objects, particles or whatever, and the color represents the state. And there are only two colors here, black and white, so there are two states. And uh, there is interaction among those, uh, uh, this is an energy function, there is interaction between those, those elements, and there may also be external fields that, 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 that influence the system. And this has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, by the way, uh, although at the end the, these, these interaction terms are derived from quantum mechanics, but it's a very simple calculation. The easy model in principle is a very simple calculation, and the thing is you can run it on any computer. People even run it on their cell phones, because even their cell phones were much less powerful than with these little easy model simulations on cell phones. And what you see in this simulation, you can see, for example, that there is this kind of structure formation. There are these areas here, uh, where uh, the, the one and two states are not uniformly distributed, but they form these kind of clusters, which may, may lead to effects like ferromagnetism. And then you can change things like temperature, and you, for example, here on the left side, this is a typical uh, uh, temperature uh, where you have critical temperature where the transition between uh, two different phases is, is taking place. I'm showing this <coughs> as an example uh, for a simulation where you don't need any quantum this is definitely easy to do on any computer, but there are other things, in particular in, 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 uh, in solid state physics, because uh, atoms are quantum objects that means they have a wave function, and the wave function extends over a certain area, in particular, if those atoms are cold, if they don't move so much, and there's interference. And there's interference over, say, a thousand atoms or so, something you cannot, you cannot simulate. People tried that, but it's not possible because you have to look for all possible states, and the number is just so phenomenal that you cannot simulate that on a normal computer. This is the way people talk about <coughs> And so, what people do is that this is a paper by Bloch and Dalibar, who was based on the final idea. They have this in a very, very simple setups. So, they have this optical trap where they put, put a couple of atoms there and they, and they watch it with a microscope. And they say, this is an interacting many body system. And the, what they like here in this kind of, you can call it a quantum computer, is the high degree of controllability and the novel detection possibilities. So you can con control, for example, the distance of the atoms by moving the laser beams around. You can control the interaction by applying magnetic fields. And then you have detection possibility. You can watch the atoms, you can watch the structure formation, for example. And you can go to extreme physical parameter regimes. And then you have something which they call artificial solids. And they say this is a is a is an exciting complementary setup that they can compare it with natural condensed matter systems, much in the spirit of this finding. Of course, you know, I hope where I, I'm going here, uh, I can make the same picture here. We are now talking neuroscience, of course, I will stop talking about solid state physics. And here also we have a complex multi-particle system. And, and at first sight it looks incredibly easier to do this. Right? I mean, you have only 10 to the 11, if you look to the human brain, 10 to the 11 uh, 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 elements, constituents, which are linked by 10 to the 15 synopsis, so that should be easier. But there are major, major differences, and it's those differences which make it so difficult. And it's those differences which make it necessary to also come up with alternative computational models. So the differences, of course, are that there are not only short range interactions, but <coughs> long range interactions. There is a very high gear dimensionality. This is not a two or three dimensional system because there are many inputs going into a neuron, the nodes at one of the network elements have connections to many other nodes. The effective dimensionality is very high, certainly more than a thousand or something like that. Then, most importantly, there is time dependence. The nodes are active and adaptive, they change all the time. And that means the whole system is time. <coughs> so it, again, in physics terms, it's not an equilibrium. It changes all the time. It's not isolated, and it interacts with the environment. And of course, it's also processes in So again, although this is very, very different, and, and already from this you see it's very, very difficult also. It's much, much more difficult to treat this than in solid state systems. The approach for understanding we do today are basically the same as in solid state systems. So. We observe macroscopic properties, so we look to the system from a distance 
And we say there are certain things that the system does. So in the solid state, you measure magnetization and conductivity. Here, for example, you know, it shows behavior, it shows cognitive behavior, maybe it has a memory, uh, which is a typical collective or macroscopic property. You can look for MRI images. This is a macroscopic observation. And, and these things are what are kind of easily accessible, I would say. But of course, they are very difficult to interpret. And so, of course, neuroscience, from since the days of, of Cajal, have started to do probe preparation to observe uh, some of the at least some of the microscopic features, for example, reading out the action potentials of the substratial uh, uh, cell potentials and things like that. And then they people do the same thing: model building theory, analytical treatment, as much as this is possible by simplified neural models, for example, and model building theory and numerical treatment. This is the whole area of computational neuroscience. And now, of course, neuromorphic computing, and that is in a way the definition of neuromorphic computing, is to build, again, control. Control is very, very important because you want to do systematic experiments. Reduced size is, unfortunately, is, is something you have to do because for the time being, nobody really knows how to build uh, uh, these model systems with, with numbers like this, but we have to start with reduced size as the solid state of the system. Uh, model systems. And, and, and this is what, what, what would be one of my in the definition of neuromorphic systems. It's very important that these systems are fed <coughs> by experimental data. And uh, I've shown this picture on, on Monday already. It's, for me, it's one of the most important pictures for experimental neuroscience, at least for, for an introduction. And it's, it, it, it again mentions these, these two scales, the scales that are important. That is the, uh, the, the spatial scale going from synapse or even below to molecules or individual ion channels or whatever, and then through neurons, layers, uh, maps, lobes, the entire brain. So there are many, many orders of magnitude here, like six in this case, and there are also six or seven orders of magnitude in time. And, and experimental neuroscience has developed a, a, a large amount of tools. And uh, looking back to my previous slide again, there are these kinds of, of tools like EEG and MEG, also PET imaging, MRI imaging, uh, which are more the collective, the macroscopic features. But there are also tools to, to measure the microscopic features, like PET and Thompson imaging, electron microscopy, all sitting at different points. Of course, ideally, you would, have, you would like to have something here, but for the time being, that's not possible. So this is the input, of course. And, and, and what we have to do uh, in, in these neuromorphic systems, we have to decide how far can we go on this scale here. And, and that is, as I will argue later, mostly a matter of money you spend, okay? In particular, going up here, and, and in principle, at some point, I think it's possible to go to these areas here, but it will just it will cost some money, uh, because here you just exploit scalability. What is far more difficult, and where we have to think a lot more, is can we also bridge time scales here? Can we bridge time scales from milliseconds to months or years? So that's very important. So if you come to, again, this is a picture, I'm sorry I showed it on Monday. If, if you look on how neuro simulations are being done, there is one plane of variables that you can look at, which is uh, speed, and here is the speed with respect to biological real time. So this is one to one, where a second is a second. Uh, this is slower than real time, a factor 100 slower, this would be much, much faster. And this is the size of the system you look at. The cortical column, the mouse brain, the human brain, down here would maybe be a single, a single cell or something like that. Now you decide on a certain spatial resolution, on a certain spatial scale, for example, having cellular level precision. And then what you find if you run a simulation is, is, is that if you go to a small system, like a single cell, for example, uh, you reach a certain simulation speed, and that happens to be here essentially one to one. Of course, it may also be faster, it may also be slower. And the question where you are for the small system size here is mostly a matter of the speed of your processor that does the calculation. For example, you can change the clock speed to some extent. If you increase the clock speed, it means you just move out here. If you decrease the clock speed, you are moving this way. And this is what people then often call the so-called strong scaling limit, and it just tells you how fast your hardware is. So this is fast hardware, this is slow hardware. Now, of course, if you have enough resources to buy more processors, you can naively, in a way, just add more processors, keep the system uh, 
uh, uh, increase the system size, but always exploit the strong scaling limit. So going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 10 to the 1 neurons, in principle, uh, uh, should, if there is perfect scalability, should not uh, in increase your computing time, or simulation time. So this is very much in the fine month spirit, right? So you just have a bigger system, and, 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 and you stick to the certain uh, simulation speed, and if you double the system, you just buy twice as many computational elements, and you, you exploit this is what people call weak scaling, and this is a, a, an example for perfect weak scaling, which never works like that in real life. But that's kind of an idealized picture. At some point, uh, you cannot afford to buy more computing elements, okay? And then you can do something interesting, which is against Feynman's rule in a way, uh, is, is, is that you now do multiplexing of calculation, so you sort of store the, st the state of the system in memory, and by that, do sequential processing of, uh, of, uh, of a larger network. So you can increase the network size, but the compute time gets slower and slower and slower, at some point you run out of memory and that's the end of it. Alright, so this is uh, how computing is being done and uh, this is a picture I also showed on Monday which I like very much. It's from uh, Marcus, who has also been teaching yesterday and who is here. And, and he has done this, I think, really computationally very fundamental experiment on one of the supercomputers in Japan, uh, which is uh, a K computer. And, and, and he has just shown how this scaling really works, and then it works in principle very nicely. Uh, so he has compute nodes, this is the number of processors you can involve in the calculation, and this is the network size measured in neuron numbers. Now, I'm not discussing the, the structure of the network, and Marcus will be able to explain that to you. But what you if you if you would expect sort of the Feynman type weak scaling thing, the Feynman would be happy if the compute time, the run time you have as a sort of problem, uh, it would be would be this flat line here. It could be anywhere. It does. It could also be up here, up there. These are two different scales. Of course. This is the network size. This is the run time. So it doesn't really matter at the moment whether the run time is 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 seconds. But but Feynman would say, well, if if the rules of his game are followed, it should be one of these lines. And what you see is that more or less that's the case. On the other hand, this is a logarithmic scale, and you see that scaling doesn't really work perfectly well. The line takes off here, and <coughs> from here to here, it's what practically is. So it means that to some extent, you can, by building multi-core, uh, by using many compute, sorry, many compute nodes, you can build a finite type computer, uh, but it doesn't really work perfectly well. On the other hand, uh, of course, in principle, the number of compute nodes can increase enormously, and maybe you can at least stay very close to this line. So, the quantum computer argument, which I draw, is that uh, these things cannot be calculated. Uh, in principle, I said that uh, the superposition of states between atoms cannot be calculated because there are so many possibilities, and there are so many states that would have to be simulated. That argument doesn't seem to be here, because and this is not a quantum system, it's a, it's a classical system. And in principle, it should be possible to do this simulation. Now, the argument I want to bring forward, why there is a fundamental limitation in using conventional computers, is more, is not as straight as in quantum physics, but I think it's also a very strong one. <coughs> That's the argument of simulation speed, and then in particular, uh, compared to the aspect that you really want and you have to cover different time scales. So the simulation speed in this particular case is about a factor of thousand slower than real time. And already on Monday I said that I see this as a really fundamental uh, limit because uh, with a factor of thousand slower than real time, even though it improves a little bit, it will be very hard to study <coughs> processes that are slow in biology, like months or years. And uh, I would claim, and this is maybe the single most important message I want to give here, I will have a special slide on that, is that bridging timescales to understand the brain is, is the essential thing. I mean, many, many people now work on time comics projects. Yes. So, so with that number of um, slowdown, uh, 1500, if you even have a strong number of day to simulate, that's three years. Yeah. It's a PhD thesis, I hope. Mm. Exactly. And, uh, and the day, according to the author, is, um, is the kind of length of time you're interested in, if you're interested in the way the network changes the plasticity. So 
I think it's fairly simple. Uh, I absolutely agree. Of course, I mean, it, it sort of it, it, it requires a knowledge of the mechanisms for plasticity in learning and development. So, I mean, what neurobiology definitely has to deliver are those rules that drive the, uh, the learning process. I will come back to that. Now, there are these two arguments energy and time. And again, I showed that similar thing on Monday. Uh, if you calculate energy, and I like energy more than power, because <coughs> Energy is power times time, and uh, really what you pay for in a way is energy and not power. And energy is what you what you do to achieve a certain result, for example, to run a light bulb for one hour, or to, to calculate a synaptic transmission. This you can do by dividing some numbers. You can get energies for synaptic transmission, and uh, <coughs> uh, this is a biological system. Here, the biological brain. I will argue for that on the next slides. It's actually 10 femtojoule, 10 to the minus 10, uh, 10 joule. And the simulations we have just seen, Marcos simulations, they sit at 0.1 millijoule, uh, which is 10 to the minus 4 joule. There are more complex brain models, for example, with blue brain uh, simulation, they uh, typically are a factor of 10,000 by 1 joule. So there are 10 or 14 orders of magnitude. Now, I mean, that I think is not a strong argument, a fundamental argument uh, to do neuromorphic computing, but because in principle you can say, well, we could run a 100 megawatt machine, or even a gigawatt machine, because the brain is so important that you can probably afford a special power, uh, a nuclear power station just to do this simulation, because humankind has to find out how the brain works. Uh, so I think this can be solved in principle. The timing problem seems a very fundamental limitation, because we really have to understand the nuclear uh, This is the energy argument. Let me elaborate a little bit on the energy argument. Can we really understand how much a neural computation costs? And, uh, and, and can we by that also understand why there is a difference between biology and silicon? I mean, many people say, well, biology is just because it, it's the cell and this web thing it must be more efficient than silicon. And, and an important conclusion I'm going to draw is that this is not the case, actually. Uh, uh, there is no fundamental difference between silicon and, and biology. How much does a neural computation cost? There are two ways to calculate that. You can go from top to bottom, and um, just using the human brain, we know it's about here, I give this power again, it's about 20 watts or something of power, and you can say it's maybe equally shared between neurons firing and synapses transmitting, you make some assumption on Hertz, and, and, and you end up with something like 10 to the minus 10 joule connection potential, 10 to the minus 40 joule per transmission. You can also go from bottom to top, you know where the energy comes from. We know that. It's uh, approximately a billion ATP molecules. You have to hydrolyze these molecules uh, which deliver the energy. You have to uh, hydrolyze 10 to the 9 billion molecules for an action potential, 100,000 for a synaptic transmission. This is the reference here, and for the Lofton they have measured that. Uh, we also know this the reference from uh, the brain and Dennis 10 to the minus 90 joule, which happens to be an electron ball, which is not surprising, that's the molecular energy state. That we get from a single molecule. Okay? And uh, doing the multiplication here, you end up with the same number. So that's kind of understandable. It'll be typically, the 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 10, and 2. Is that fundamentally different from electronics? Actually, it's not. And uh, so a transistor, we will see more of a transistor later, but in a very naive way, and we had this very <coughs> nice talk by um, Holger uh, two days ago, the evening talk, where he said that. In fact, if you don't go to very tiny sub deep sub micron processes, switching is really the essential thing, charging capacitances. And uh, he even had a formula here, which is one half C U squared capacitance times voltage squared. And this is a very sim simple circuit here, which is driven by <coughs> 5 volts, which of course is, is an ancient. Uh, people now use 1 volt or 1.8 or even below 1 volt. But I, for reasons of the simplicity or just history, I use 5 volts here, uh, and the transistor is a capacitor. So there is a, a conducting plane, a conducting plane, and in between it's an insulator. And this is also the reason for the M or S regulation. And we have seen on this little uh, solid state picture I've shown before that these are only a few atom layers. On the super modern transistor I showed before, it was maybe 10. Here I say it's less than 100. So I can do some calculation just by basic physics, as I said, one half capacitance times voltage squared. The capacitance <coughs> depends on the area and the thickness here, multiplied with epsilon, the uh, dielectric constant. 
the switching of one of these elements, the charging of one of these elements, is approximately one femtojoule, and is even much less today for small than transistors because capacitors are brought into the area. And, and so this is much, much less than we pay for a synaptic transmission in our own, in our own brain. In fact, it's a factor of 10 less. No? Uh, that means the switching, uh, the synaptic transmission corresponds to the switching of 10 very low tech CMOS transistors. So these individual devices are extremely energy efficient. So the conclusion is it's not the devices, it's the architecture and the computation involved. Of course, in Google, uh, this is what a real microprocessor looks like. This is just the, the metal part of an ancient IBM G5 processor. So it's a more or less two-dimensional system of connecting wires. And then there are two things here. First of all, you are not just charging the transistors. You are charging all the wires. And the, the, the system is totally dominated by wires. You see there are capacitances everywhere. Capacitances show all these wires. That typically is 1,000 to 10,000 times more energy in the wires compared to the transistors. And as long as you switch, you have to charge wires all the time. As long as leakage currents and so on. That's part of the energy problem. Now, the, the, the even worse thing is you use this network to perform logic operations based on Boolean algebra, which is not too well suited to calculate at least some real world problems. problems. For example, solve differential equations because, for example, you have to calculate exponential functions all the time, which is not completely easy because it requires a lot of steps, excessive lookup tables of developing tail expansions and things like that. So there is an energy problem and an architecture problem, and they are interrelated. Now, uh, you all know how a modern computer looks like. This is a sort of a general digital computation system. This is a picture taken from Toby Delbert. Uh, and so typically, if you, if, you, if you have a system that interacts with the world, you need an ADC, an analog digital converter, which is in turn connected to a sensor, of course, let's say a temperature sensor or something. <coughs> and maybe you want to act on the world through a motor, and then you need a digital with an analog converter. <coughs> in between, there is this kind of processing unit, which has a memory, uh, which has registers uh, can perform computational logic like NANDs and NORs, and of course is driven by a clock. So there's a fast global clock, they fit perfect deterministic logic states, memory distant from computation, and of course these ADC thing, which is not part of the, of the computation, but which is also important. Uh, of course, the implementation is often in the phenomenon architecture, not always, there are many deviations from the new phenomenon architecture. For example, the hardware architecture, which was even developed. But basically, it's, it's always that the main message is that CPU and main, main memory are <coughs> separated, and that the essentials are that data and instructions are stored in the main memory. This is a stored program concept. The content of the memory is addressable by location. Instructions are executed sequentially uh, unless the order is modified by the program. And of course, in terms of energy consumption, is that the separation between these two things is crucial because you remember all these copper lines there in, in, in the case of the G5 processor, they have to be recharged all the time. Coming to brain simulations, of course, this is a severe problem uh, because um, we need faster and faster computers, and uh, this is a, 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 a plot which, in, in a way, the plots is what are called computational complexity. These are the memory requirements. And today we run petaflop computers, or ten petaflop computers. And what people like like Markram and others do with their rather uh, complex cell models, they can safely simulate what they call a cellular mesocircuit for whatever purpose. I'm not discussing this here, and maybe now approach cellular rodent brain simulations. And there is the idea: if we get enough money in HP, <coughs> it will be great over the next ten years. Uh, and somebody gives us, what, 500 million for an exaflop computer, we will make this step here, and we go to a cellular brain model, and we have to make sure that we get enough memory to store the model, which is not so easy. Now, that's great, uh, but then we still have this machine which runs slowly, and which only covers maybe hundreds of milliseconds or maybe a couple of seconds in the development of this system. And already the author of this slide, which is very German, he uh, kept already kept pointing out that there is, we want to go further than that. And in particular, in computational complexity to do the cool stuff. Because honestly, I mean, if you look to one of these simulations of a uh, cortical column, I mean, we are among us here. I mean, the scientific value so far is somewhat limited. I mean, you see nice firing patterns. Uh, I hope nobody is uh, taking notes here. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it's a very nice 
simulation in principle, but the, the scientific knowledge that has been generated for that so far is not huge. I still think it's necessary and important to do this, to show how you can do computation. But the cool stuff would start out here, okay? So you keep kind of the size of the system, uh, that's not the point, but the computational complexity has to increase. Uh, so for example, people are asking questions, what about glial cells? We'll comment on that later. And, and, and the, the supply system, the, the, the blood system, uh, we may go to, and that requires maybe in fact 10 more, which is totally inaccessible. 10 exaflops will not be there. Okay, what about going sort of below the cellular level, which probably asks for a factor of 1,000, which is again totally out of reach. And molecular dynamic, funny enough, is a factor of a billion. That's why you need to simulate the brain on the molecular level, which is the, not even have to discuss this. But the uh, more important thing, and that is the points I want to make, let's just be learning. And, and here also people say, well, you probably need a factor of 1,000 or 100 more. 100 to 1,000 more, and that is not accessible. I mean, it's clear there will be no export machines by 2020, <coughs> and I think also not by 2030. So we absolutely have to think, if we want to do this, and I think we have to do this, we have to think about other means of doing computing. Time scales are very important, as said that over time. This is one of my favorites. Picture, uh, if, if you really want to go to the level of, of where synapses, for example, do interesting things like spike time independent plasticity, uh, causality detection, uh, 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 I will discuss this later, happens in nature at the level of milliseconds or sub milliseconds, 100 microseconds here. Synaptic plasticity, seconds, learning days, and all the years. If you want to include evolution, which is also science fiction, and, and it would be millennia. Um, so that's 12 orders of magnitude, that's 15 orders of magnitude. So in timing, there are also many orders of magnitude, and they are far more difficult to bridge. And the simulation, if you go to supercomputer simulations, this synaptic plasticity and, and, and stuff like that is, is easily accessible. I mean, if you have a big computer like a Peta or exascale computer, and you run the simulation for seconds, thousand seconds, or maybe a couple of days, and that is great, you can really do it, but this definitely is, is not accessible. And so this is the most important slide. I think, that's my opinion, the only way we ever make use of artificial neural circuits, which may be derived from biology, for example, through these connection projects, of which there are many out there in the world, like the Ellen Brain project, for example, derived from biology, that the, the only way to make use of it is to make them adaptive, so that they really interact with data in close loop. Perception action loops, but also uh, interaction with the aspect. And, and the adaptivity is, uh, has to be in terms of connectivity. These systems have been able to rewire in terms of the synaptic weights and the synaptic features, and maybe also the neurons. So, how can we do that? The computers are maybe conventional computers, not the right thing. Uh, this is now a, a microscopic view of, uh, of uh, of compute units, this is a conventional microprocessor. For some reason, I have the G5 pictures. But this is an implementation of what, what we just said of a, of a conventional computer architecture. It's very modular, as you can see. It's very engineering friendly. It's easy to put quotation marks. Map programming models, everybody, almost everybody, can program a computer. You can learn that in school, and then you have a programming language, and you can do very, very useful thing. And most importantly, it's theoretically sound. I think we understand. The theory of uh, of uh, von Neumann machines. Uh, this is a brain. It's not a it's not a, a microscopic picture, but a reconstructed picture from the two brain project in the EPL and, and, and about the same length scale. And what you see is the essential difference. Is it's kind of uniform. You don't see uh, the modularity, although there seems to be some structure in layers and columns. I'll come back to that later. There is no obvious separation. At least not by looking at it from the spatial distribution, which you can see here between memory and computing, it's definitely not programmed. And the worst is that there is no established theory. To be more a bit at the computational view, if you look to the systems on the left side, they are processor memory based architectures, serial command execution, implementing the Turing model, uh, predetermined algorithms, defined capabilities and performance. That's the need for software, reproducible states, and reversible time evolution, electronics implementation of Boolean operations, which <coughs> will affect, which I just discussed of relatively high power conduction. High yield requirement, little small tolerance. I was very impressed when we had the Holger Eisenreich's uh, lecture, and as I said two days ago, 
and you try to extract from him how many transistors can fail on a, on a, on a microprocessor. And as David pointed out, in memory, yes, if you lose part of the memory, that's not a problem. But if it's a computational unit, these things are dead. And I mean, there are hundreds of millions of transistors these days in modern microprocessors. And this is why fault tolerance is a real issue. Uh, and, and the high yield requirements. This was discussed nicely by the very intervention. It's limited by the ultimately component limited by the atomic distance scale of the components. So nanometer is kind of the end of the uh, of the uh, of, of the development, which I was again discussed in the lecture and I also showed this, this picture earlier. It's well understood, that's the good thing. Neural computation is really maximally parallel. <coughs> very nonlinear computing elements, so we'll look at that. The generation of action potentials of spikes is a very, very nonlinear process. Uh, the elements have huge diversity, very large uh, variation, which is definitely to be avoided up here. Time correlation describes the dynamics uh, of the, the time change, for example, spike time dependent plasticity. Learning is an important aspect. Low power consumption, high fault tolerance, I discussed that. And limited by the degree of complexity. So it's, I think, not so much component limited, although it would be nice there small components, but really I think what, what we have to work on is most of the architecture and also the size. If you just have a little thing that can simulate 100 years, <coughs> it's maybe not so useful. So we should make an effort to go to a large architecture. And the bad thing is not nice. Do you want to say yes. one extra thing to your final point there, which I think is cost. Yes. Is the major one here, yeah, the yeah. yeah. I still think Cost should not be an issue. I know it's an issue. You're a physicist. Yeah. It's a, I know we all suffer from the fact that we cannot afford it. We're not even an HPP who will be able to build the next generation system. But I mean, this is an important, important research topic. I mean, so many times we invest in this, but I mean, you know. uh, What is neuromorphic computing? That that is not my definition. Implement, and I added here some aspects <coughs> of structure and function, not only structure. I think structure is not enough. Function is important. Of biological circuits is analog or digital. So I would say it doesn't really matter whether it's analog or digital. It has to be discussed what is analog or digital, what are the advantages and disadvantages. And I call it images of the on, on electronic substrate. And electronic substrates are pieces of silicon, mostly today. But it may also be different stuff, like nanowires or something in the future. Probably also silicon as a basis. But I just call it in a very neutral way, electronic substrate. What does electronics mean? Mm. Electronic, I mean, it, it, it includes the word electron. <coughs> so what, what, I think all neuromorphic systems will always be based on the movement of electrons, rather than the movements of ions in the biological system. So that is a different thing. <coughs> but otherwise, the behavior should be the same or similar to some extent. What do I mean by structure? I think it's clear. I mean, the cells, the networks, the connections, a function, the processing, the local one in the cells, the communication, and of course the time in the So, what are the methodological approaches? Um, there are four ways to do these things. <coughs> you can do bottom up, alright? That means you use the. Uh, you, you start from the atoms of the brain in the brain, which are probably, although we don't know whether that's right, the cells, the synapses, the connectivity, mechanisms for learning. I call this atoms and their interaction, and then you assemble them. The other one is top down, based on large scale functional blocks and their interrelations, for example, areas of the brain, like how does the visual area attract with the motor area, how can we get close to operation. So these things are often seen as in conflict. And there are people who say, well, we should do things bottom up, and others say we should do things top down. Now, in reality, of course, you will have to do both at the same time. Uh, I think uh, you will probably not be able to build a real <coughs> computing device with the advantages of, of low energy consumption and, and with sufficient execution speed if you just do these things top down on your laptop. Because the only way to top down is really on the laptop by writing programs that uh, uh, describe the area and their interaction. Uh, so you have to go bottom up. What will also not work is you just throw these, these elements, the neurons and the synapses, together and hope that interesting properties will emerge. Okay? This word emergence is often used, but it, it will just not work. So you, what you have to do is, is you have to do a close interaction between the microscopic scan and the microscopic scan. So you have to build these things microscopically in order to exploit, for example, energy efficiency, 
where you have to bring in the constraints of down. And this is one of the fundamental fights in HPP, where there is somehow a top down and a bottom up fraction in the project, which I find is a, is a mistake. We should yeah, we have to exploit all that we have, but, but we should not only work top down. We definitely, if we want new computing architectures, and we have to implement, the implementation will be bottom up. I think there's no way out. But the cells and synapses are the right units in the First principles, that's another thing. Design of computational paradigms, which are not necessarily plausible. I, had, I, I mentioned this strange thing with computing. There are many other examples uh, which are theory driven, which may have some biological inspiration, but are, are, are not really just reverse engineered features of biology. And that's very important. And we do that in HPP, and there will be lectures on Saturday where you learn some of these. Uh, he said first principles. There's also a strange thing here which I like to mention. Evolutionary, you can even generate computational structure based on biologic laws of an element by evolutionary algorithms. <coughs> now, if you want to do this, you have to look to biology, if you want to do things microscopically, what you have to do, you have to implement connectivity, diversity, plasticity, and timing. Connectivity, there are these numbers which you have to consider, 10,000 synapses per neuron on, uh, on average. In, Particle neuron, diversity, there are many different categories and parameters of neurons, plasticity, long term, short term, local, local global, timing, time constants, delays, and correlations. That is what the biology tells us. So, if you are an engineer or somebody building a system like that, you have to think, well, connectivity, how can I do that? So, I need data protocols. I have to think on how these things are talking to each other. Uh, what is it that I choose to, to, to sort of take the essentials of biology? How do I guarantee that I have the right connectivity? Can I do things two dimensionally, for example? Probably to a certain extent, but later not. So I have to go to 3D connection technology, which is a very important technology development. Diversity. If there are so many different parameters of neurons, I have to be prepared in my neuromorphic implementation uh, uh, to have uh, configurability. So if I have a million neurons, I have to make sure that they are not all the same. And there are two ways of achieving that. One is to say, ah, by nature, these <coughs> solid-state companies, they are producing lousy transistors, so automatically they will not all be the same. But that's probably not what you want. You want to do this in a controlled way. So the only thing to do this is to have the cells and the connections configurable. <coughs> so you, as a user, want to sit there turning some knobs or typing into your computer configure the steps the way so that they behave biologically correct. <coughs> I said that we have to see how to ah it's there in biology, not the global, but it means you have to implement it. And that requires memory, for example. If it's it synapse, for example, is plastic following some rules, it means that the local synapse needs some memory. And it has to be distributed memory because it sits in the synapse. And if at some point you have 10 to the 15 synapses, that means you need 10 to the 15 memory locations. And that's very, a very different problem from normal computing, where you have a memory here, and the compute you need here. Now you have this totally distributed. So you need a good technology to build 10 to the 50 in the extreme memory locations that are all kind of changing with time, which is not easy, right? Timing, you have to control time constants. They are there, and you want to see what they do. You have to control delays and also time correlations. And then there is something which is specific for, uh, for uh, hardware. Is, is the issue of scalability. The, the, the biology, biology has solved it automatically. I mean, brains are to some extent scalable. Evolution has shown how to do this. We have to do it by hand. We have to see that our systems are scalable. And the only way, I think, is to learn from some small systems to approach larger scales. And, and the, the restrictions you see in engineering are how do I achieve the right bandwidth? How do I introduce the right delays? Uh, what do I pay for scalability? What are the power costs? financial costs, and then what is the effect on all products. There is a big discussion in neuromorphic computing, and, uh, and that is analog or digital, what is better. And again, there are religions, it's everywhere in science, there are the analog people and there are the digital people, and of course, it's always one that's not so easy, and I think uh, many ways should be explored. Uh, if I compare analog versus digital, this is analog, this is digital here, Analog means computers continuous values of physical variables, and the good thing is that the primitives of computation derive from component physics, for example, an RC, uh, a circuit has automatically an exponential function generated by it, so that's very, very convenient in terms of power, 
one wire represents many bits of information. I mean, bits is just a measure of information in the Schengen sense, it doesn't mean zeros and ones. Bits is just a negative logarithm of the probability for information to occur, so you can measure information in bits. And clearly, an analog wire represents many bits, not infinitely many, if your resolution affects noise, but many bits of information. Noise is due to thermal fluctuations and possibly cross fault. And the bad thing is definitely that if you go analog, is signal integrity, signal restoration. If you have many stages in a network, you just send the signal, it gets worse and worse and worse. Okay? There's dispersion of the signal, and, and, and that is means it's bad for scalability. In this way, you compute with discrete values of physical variables, primitives of computation you take from Boolean algebra. One wire represents a bit of information, at least at a given time. The number of bits depends on the number of Boolean gates. Noise is due to limited digital precision, right? And you never have infinite precision, but you can approach it. And the good thing, of course, is that signals are perfect. They are always restored. As soon as you go through a gate, they come out fresh and clean and, and are reliable and good. So this is what you call uh, an error. System. Of course, there is another approach, which is you can mix the thing, which is a little bit more like, like what we do on our own brain. You can do local analog computation on energy intensive tasks, <coughs> but then the communication, like structure and potential, is binary, but still continuous in time and asynchronous, which, by the way, can also be the case in the digital system. And then you achieve uh, a signal restoration of most of these systems. So these are kind of different approaches. And there's one thing which also later I will introduce. Uh, I'm just going to pass it to you. It's really more than 25 hours. Uh, later I will introduce uh, some systems in practice, and often people praise the number of neurons. If you look at the IBM chip, for example, you look at all the press releases, they say we have a million neurons. And I mean, why I always say it's not so difficult to make many neurons. We have a lot of chips and the difficulty is really to connect things. And uh, that's in particular if you really want a thousand inputs into a quarter of a neuron for a large number, maybe not 20 or 50, but still be hundreds of thousands or millions. And, and so you have to really think on how you do the communication between the neurons. This is something from this guy from the uh, University of Bordeaux and CB General School. And, and so you can distinguish between fundamentally three different ways of discrete time, discrete signal, where you transmit bits in a, in, a, in a time structure given by a clock, you can do continuous time, discrete signal, where time is a continuous variable, so the spikes the actual potential occur at, at any time, there is no clock structure imposed, but you see they are all the same, there is no information uh, stored in the clock cycle, these are just delta functions, or not delta functions, but rectangular functions, which is still good. Uh, so that's continuous time discrete signal, and then you get over biology that's continuous time continuous signal. So time is a continuous variable, and also the, the, the horizontal and the vertical axis, which is the, uh, the voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell, and, and, and you see this kind of structure, substructural activity, and then the spikes really look like spikes. And uh, this is a real important entry, and you see that, that there is actually variability here. The concept is not the same. The question is where is it coming from? Uh, all the parts come from the measurement, the precision of the measurement. <coughs> there may also be some variability, but one of the assumptions of almost all, I think even all neuromorphic implementations that have ever been done, is that this variation which you see here is not important. That there is no information stored in these little fluctuations here. And, and, and if you believe that that's the case, or there is no final proof, then you should maybe not make the effort to really simulate that shape, unless, unless you want to communicate with a real biological system. You want to plant the shape in your brain, or in a piece of brain tissue on a, on a, in a petri dish, then you better make sure that you speak the same language. The petri dish, the brain size in the petri dish, would not understand this language. It would also not understand that language, because the plot sites are often not correct, they are more anatomically driven. It would only understand this language. So at least the layer of the biological system should be like this. Now, now, you see, as always, the system. The system is not so easy. Um, this is the propaganda sign for neuromorphic systems. An interesting uh, question is, I mean, like many others, I have been praising neuromorphic computing. It is great, it solves energy problems, timing problems. It's, we can learn how learning in the, in the brain works. 
So why did it happen? I mean, nobody is ever you. There are only strange people using your remote system, like you and me, all right? And, uh, and, and nothing <coughs> useful has ever been done. I mean, not even. I would say that neuroscience, the profit of neuroscience on neuromotic systems is zero. All right, the, the, it is not useful at all. It's not useful for, for for doing practical things like deep learning or recognizing handwriting. It is not useful for neuroscience. So in a way, it's totally useless. It's an esoteric field where some strange people work. But that's very bizarre because there are all these arguments for it. So why is it? Why are we in such a bad situation? Uh, I mean, I think there are three reasons. I will actually give you four reasons, but one of them is that's important. Uh, one is that, and this is one reason, is, is that we, of course, is biology, and biology has two aspects. One is we don't really know microscopically whether we are doing the right thing here, I mean, are the cells, and, and things like, for example, the, uh, the structure of the cells, the, the points where the synapses connect. Have we understood all this? Definitely not. I mean, there are many things which we haven't understood. The other thing is the network. Uh, we haven't understood the network structure of the brains and what the purpose of the networks are. That means there is a lack of neuroscience knowledge. There is a third reason which is often underestimated, and this is a very provocative picture I'm showing you now. Uh, this, this one here, I think this is one of the reasons. Is that neuromotive engineering has often been done through setups like that, which are great actually. I mean, this is probably Denver's camera and uh, this is some of his chips. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad. I mean, these people who are we, we all have these kind of setups and all that. We have it, and I think you have that in Manchester. It's these kind of lab setups which are nice to explore the principles to write publications, and it's typically sort of a, a PhD and thesis project. But then the PhD student goes, you have to start from scratch, and it's always it's at the level of, of building little, little lab samples. And I think if we want to use the remote computing, it should be others, not those who build neuromorphic systems, but those who do not build neuromorphic systems have to use them. Uh, like the laptop. I mean, you are not building the laptop and then using it, which is buying it and using it with more high level stuff. And so, to really make neuromorphic computing a commodity that can just be used through the internet or on your desktop, that would be very important. Uh, there is often a reason which is brought forward is that we are using the wrong devices. This is an example for a little transistor here with a gain of 30 nanometer. Uh, uh, this is not the reason. Okay? The lack of the proper components, which is sometimes brought forward, we have to wait for good components, that's not the case. As I said very clearly, our components are great in terms of energy consumption, also in terms of size. That's not the limiting factor. I would think there are basically two remaining reasons, which is a lack of neuroscience <coughs> knowledge, which calls for something like configurability, really because you don't know what the networks are, you don't know what the parameters of the cells are, you have to be able to configure them as a user, and there is no serious implementation. And that is calls for large-scale systems, also trying to make this argument, but more importantly, for usable systems, so they can really use as a non-expert. Um, um, before I close this section, and then we maybe break in for the questions, and, uh, and then after the break, I will introduce practical systems, then we go through two more slides, one is, why are we doing it at all? What are these things doing? And uh, there are four reasons here, I think. One is a neuroscience research tool. As I said, it hasn't been done so far. There is no proof that this is a neuroscience research tool at the moment. But I think, in particular, exploring the speed is very, very important, the scalability. And that means understand a wide range of time scales in one experiment, which really emulates millisecond effects over long time scales of your space. Verify falsified multi-scale theories of development of this. And I think the remote computing is the only way to do this, absolutely the only way to overcome the strong scaling limitations. Now the computing architectures uh, exploit the key features which I mentioned and then really go away from biology and use these systems to process noise <coughs> and make data make predictions outside biology. Then, of course, if you look at our systems now, Manchester system, our system, the IBM system. They are not very uh, portable in a way. They are monstrous, right? And 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 they are probably little systems which are which can be used for experiments like you here. But if you want at the same time high complexity, but also a, 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 a reasonably small size, 
what you have to do is you have to use your morphic system to exploit the principles of combination and then the next step would be to simplify and minimize circuits for specific consumer oriented applications and robotics. Right? So, sort of, my idea is that we use the big systems behind. Now we find interesting circuits and then we give up configurability. We say, at this moment, I don't want configurability anymore because I found a good solution. And then you export it and you put it onto the special chip. That's what I think this downscaling is a very, very important step. We are not there, uh, but I hope that within the time scale of HTTP, this will also be. Something to do, at least be said in the process. And then finally, it's, it's also a nice system demonstrator for how to scale devices. In principle, of course, these things have really small scale. You would later see that the setups today are relatively large. If you can make them nanos and meters, then that's good, and you can correlate imperfection and lack of precision. And then this would be the industry standard, maybe the only one to really uh, use these devices and, and use it as a backend for the CMOS technology. And that's then at the end in the approach to reach more than 10 to 50 non-memory storage service systems. Probably that will not be done as conventional systems. Final slide before, before we do the break. Important issue is uh, what's the computational goal? And I'd like to just show this here, which I think is also very important. Are we going to build artificial brains? I think not. And the reason is that a lot of features which are known today are missing. So it would be very dangerous to claim that, actually it would be silly to claim that. But the observation in the past, and I show this thing here, which is actually from 1958, right? This is the invention of the perceptron. This is also the paper. Perceptron probably is the important information storage organization of the brain. Uh, many people would say, this is not biology. I mean, that is just a, 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 a conventional neural network. Integrating input information by having, for example, no timing aspect, it's just a perceptron. But in a way, this is an extremely dramatically incomplete aspect of biology, you would say. Now, it's, you would say these neurons are not at all neurons in, in a biological sense, but there are some biological principles which are brought into this circuit. One is that there's a layered structure of nodes, which normally you don't do in computing, certainly not in those days. And there is another important aspect. Biology, just a tiny bit of idea from biology which has been brought in. That's the one of inhibition. All right? There's this little neuron here which adds up these inputs and then produces an output which is minus 2. All right? So it, 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 starts, <coughs> it contributes to this neuron not producing enough. And why is that interesting? Well, this is the implementation of the XOR, a very simple logical function, which is quite interesting because you plot it in the input output, playing this key typical example of a of a logical solution that is not solvable by linear separation. So it's quite kind of tricky also. The Boolean implementation is uh, somewhat more complicated than the normal case. Uh, but here you can implement by using biological principles, in particular by, by using the principle of inhibition. So just taking one aspect of biology, leaving out many, many other things, spiking neurons, video cells, all these things we discussed today, people ignored it, they already did some useful computations. What I'm claiming is you can put in some aspects of biology and then always gain a little bit of computation of power. And, and, and if, you, if you simplify, simplify this direction, you will always lose, right? And the question is, is the curve like this or is it like that, all right? So, so if, you, if, if you, we start from a biologically precise cell which sits up here, and we simplify by taking out compartments, for example, by taking out individual uh, ion channels, by making all kinds of simplification, are we staying on a line like that in terms of the computational probability, or is it just dropping like that? And this is something we have to systematically explore. <coughs> That's also a very important aspect of the human brain. I will now, after the break, talk about implementations. I introduce a little bit some biological principles, and uh, maybe I have too much for applications, but implementations are more important. So I stop for the time being, and I give them. Uh, Share the word. Yeah, thank you for this. Uh...